Hi, everyone. Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to be introduced to a couple things. First, the evolution of bipedalism. So in our last lecture, we left off uh, talking about the evolution of primates over about 55 to 60 million years. And at the very end, we, we looked at the era of the Miocene. And the Miocene is called the era of the apes for a reason. It's where we see a huge explosion of ape-like characteristics. But since it ends at about 5 million years ago, we also potentially see the origin of bipedal humans during this time. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is look at the features of a biped, because these are the features that we're looking for in fossils in the archaeological record to indicate the first humans, the first what we call habitual bipeds. Because as you can see from our PowerPoint here, humans are the only habitual bipeds among primates, meaning we constantly walk on two feet. And the question of why this would have evolved and, and the slow transition, what that transition looks like is what we're going to cover here. We'll identify what it means to be a biped and we'll look for those features in some of the earliest specimens that we have. Let's talk first about what bipedalism is. So bi means two, ped is the foot. So bipedal means that you walk on two feet. This is different from quadruped, quad meaning four. Most primates are quadrupeds with the capability of bipedalism and erect posture. But humans the, are the bipeds that are habitual. And the bipedal gait looks a little bit like this. You can imagine that it's actually quite complicated to stand on two feet, especially with the amount of weight we have in our torso, which is the heaviest part of our body. And all of that weight being on just these two very delicate parts of our body, the feet. So there are a lot of things which have to change about the human body in order for bipedalism to be the primary method of locomotion. One of the first things that changes is the shape of the spine. You'll notice in our quadrupedal, primarily quadrupedal ape here, that the spine has a very small curvature to it. But when you are a biped, a habitual biped, the spine starts to take, the, and the vertebral column starts to take an S-like shape to it, with the bottom of the S really pulling forward in the lumbar area. Now, the reason for this is due to the transition to bipedalism. A curved spine allows for a greater amount of support and protection of the nervous system. And, and this is because the curvature of the spine allows it to absorb shock, almost like an, it almost has an accordion-like effect. I'm exaggerating this a little bit to, to make the point. But as you can imagine, you know, the heaviness of the body, what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of pressure on the vertebrae. And so by having this almost accordion-like effect due to the curvature, you get some of that absorption, that shock absorbed into the spine. It also allows for balance when leaning forward and backward. So you can practice this at home. It's something normally I would do in class, but try to pick up a heavy object and see what your body does naturally in order to keep you balanced. And what you'll notice is when you pick up a heavy object like this, your inclination is going to be to lean backwards. The reason you're doing that is because you're exaggerating the lumbar curvature. You're pushing that lumbar forward. The reason why the lumbar is pushed forward naturally and why it your inclination is to lean back and exaggerate it is because it is a balance mechanism. If the spine were straight and the vertebral column were straight down the back the way it is with an ape, when we picked up a heavy object, we would fall forward. And so by bringing that lumbar forward, what it does is it rebalances the weight in the torso and it allows us to have a greater amount of balance on two feet. So the lumbar are not only larger, but they're pushed forward in that S shape in order to give us a significant amount of balance and shock absorption. 
The pelvis also has to change quite a bit. You're seeing iliums or iliac blades, if you remember from our bone discussion here. We have a modern Homo sapien, we have an early human, and we have a great ape. You'll notice that the iliac blade is very different among the ape. It's much taller and more narrow. Uh, overall. And if you put it in place in the pelvis, you can actually see why. So the pelvis differences are very dramatic between these bipeds here and our ape. In our ape, those iliac blades are facing forward. And in the humans and the bipeds, they're actually curved almost like a bowl. And this is because the torso is sitting in the pelvis like a bowl when you are a biped. Whereas when you're a quadruped, you're leaning forward. And so what these tall, narrow iliac blades are going to do for our ape is allow for muscle attachment to deal with the heaviness of the torso as it's leaning forward. Whereas these cup-shaped iliac blades in the human bipedal pelvis are going to allow for the torso to balance and sit inside of it as if it were a bowl. You can see also that some changes occur to the legs, specifically the femurs and the knees. In our ape, you'll notice that the femurs are parallel to each other. And when you look at your legs, they look like they're parallel to each other. But actually, if you take the skin and flesh and muscle away, the bones are angled inward. And what this does is it brings the legs underneath the torso that allows for a more fluid movement of the legs. When an ape walks bipedally, they have to do so very awkwardly. Instead of having the fluidity that we have like this, they have to move their hips one at a time, right? So hip forward, next hip forward, hip, hip, hip. And this slows them down dramatically. Try walking somewhere like this, one, two, and you'll see it's very slow and it's also not very energy efficient. And that's probably the primary explanation for the evolution of bipedalism in humans. When we're looking at the Miocene period, one thing we noticed in our last lecture is that it's a consistently, we're seeing some consistent drying trends around the world. And that means that grasslands are getting larger forested areas, fruit patches, things like that are getting further and further away from each other. So primates are having to travel longer distances to get food. What bipedalism does is it's energy efficient. With the movement of those femurs to be angled so that the legs are underneath, we get um, about 75% more efficiency. We also have a change in the kneecap. So in apes, the legs are much more mobile and rotational comparatively to ours. And you'll notice in our uh, in a couple upcoming slides that the feet are very different as well. They're still grasping, they're still using their legs very similar to the way that they're using their arms. But as a biped, you can't do that. And a rotational mobility in the knee is going to mean that the knee could come out of place as you're walking, which some of us have experienced in our lifetimes, I'm sure. And so in the biped, we have a flatter, knee cap that limits rotational mobility. We also have some muscular changes here. We have a very dramatically increased rectus femoris, which is a femoral or a femur muscle that's responsible for propulsion of the bipedal legs. And it's attached to the anterior inferior iliac spine via this tendon here and this tendon here. So this is a very large muscle. We also have very large gluteal muscles comparatively to other primates. Then we have adductor muscles in the upper parts of the legs. These are very large in humans and small in apes. And these muscles are important. They attach to the linea aspera. If you remember that line on the back of the femur, which helps with the pulling motion of bringing that leg forward. So these are much, much larger, considerably larger in bipedal humans than they are in apes. Now, finally, we are looking at the lower body here. The last thing that we see that has to change is the shape of the foot. On the left, we have a bonobo foot, and you'll notice that we have kind of long gripping toes as well as a divergent opposable toe. 
Now, if you were to walk like this and add this to the ape, the complicated kind of tedious ape walk, you also get a little bit of a bounce, right? And so this slows apes down bipedally as well. In humans, in bipeds, what we see is that all the toes shorten to prevent tripping, including the big toe, which comes in line so that all five of the toes are together at the top of the foot with minimal divergence. We also have a very large arch, ideally under the bottom of our foot and a large heel cal or calcineus, as you remember. In this arch, we have what's called the, planto, the, the plantar aponeurosis, which is uh, an important tendon that stretches in the foot and it allows for the foot to recycle energy, which is likely another reason why walking bipedally is more energy efficient as a human than it is as an ape. There are also some changes that we're going to see in the skulls. One of them that relates to bipedalism is the foramen magnum. Now the foramen magnum is the hole under the skull where the spinal cord meets the brain. When you are a biped, that foramen magnum is gonna be central. It's gonna be directly underneath the skull. You'll notice the difference compared to an ape. Now, all primates have a more centralized foramen magnum than any other mammals, but humans, bipedal humans have the most centralized foramen magnum. So as we start to meet fossils, that fit in the time period of when we think humans started evolving, one of the things we're looking for is the orientation of the form in magnum. And we'll meet this creature here in a moment. Some other features are changing in humans during this time as well that don't relate to bipedalism necessarily, but I want to address because we are meeting early humans in this lecture as well. One of them is a reduced post-orbital constriction. So in your ape here, you can see what's called post-orbital constriction. I could take my fingers and pinch behind the eye orbits of an ape and of early humans as well. This is a modern human skull. You'll see that the post-orbital constriction has been reduced to basically zero. So what we're seeing when this happens is that the brain is also increasing in size and the musculature that's needed for chewing and things in the faces of apes are gradually declining over time. So this is something we're looking for in early human, in, in human evolution as well, is the gradual reduction of post-orbital constriction as brains get larger and faces get smaller. You can see that the faces are getting smaller. Again, we have an ape. We have an early human here, and we have an archaic human, and then we have a modern human. What we're looking at is called prognathism. Prognathism refers to the projection of the face, and particularly the mouth. And you'll notice in the ape that we have still quite a bit of prognathism. Again, not nearly as much as in non-primate mammals, but much more than among later humans who have relatively flat faces. One of the reasons for this is that humans start manipulating their food. We start cooking our food, we start chopping our food, we start preserving our food. And as a result of this, we no longer need a lot of this excessive musculature in the face and skull in order to grind and chew and, and, and do all of those things. So the face gradually becomes more delicate and flatter and prognathism is reduced in exchange for an increasing cranium size. The changes in our need for chewing and diet also affect our dental arcade or the arch that we have in our teeth. We have in apes what's called a rectangular dental arcade, and that's because the jaw is pulled forward. It's prognathic. It's pulling away, so it tends to be more narrow, long, and rectangular. But as the face flattens, we're starting to see what's called the parabolic arch of more modern human species, where instead of being long and narrow, it's very short and rounded. Now the simian shelf, which is asterisked here, also gets removed as a result of the loss of prognathism, as well as an ape trait of the shearing honing complex. When an ape closes its mouth, its canines sharpen themselves using this shearing complex. 
but because we are manipulating our food again, we also don't need this. And so humans have gradually lost this as well in exchange for the parabolic arch. So these are all the traits that we're looking for. An accumulation of these traits is going to make for a modern bipedal human. Now, what we're looking for in the archeological record and the fossil record are fossils that are gradually accumulating these traits. One of the earliest examples of these, although now controversial, well, always controversial, is Sahelanthropus chadensis, which is about 6 million years old. This species, we have a skull and a femur. And while the femur is highly debated, and well, the skull is a little bit debated as well, but what we're going to look at are the arguments that this is potentially a bipedal ancestor. Now, Sahelanthropus chedensis has a very small brain case, but a much more vertical face, a very large brow ridge and large muscles and things like that are going to represent the ape-like characteristics of this creature. But the smaller canines and the foramen magnum that is more centrally located, you can see in this image here, almost centrally located, much more centrally located than the chimpanzee, makes this a potential ancestor for early humans as early as six to seven million years ago during the Miocene. Artipithecus ramidus is really not controversial, but not old enough to be the earliest biped. This is a 4.4 million year old species found in Ethiopia that has a pelvis that's derived, meaning it started to accumulate the bowl-like shape that the modern human bipedal pelvis will have. Now, this creature still had a divergent toe, big toe, as you can see in the recreation here, but otherwise had the foot of a biped. Now, this is exactly what we would expect of early bipedal humans. They were capable of more increased efficient bipedalism during the day, but probably still used some of their ape-like characteristics like these long arms and fingers and opposable toes in order to take advantage of the trees for protection at night. Finally, we have the Australopithecines. And Australopithecines were on this planet for about 3 million years, the oldest being about 4.2 million years old and the last seen about 1.2 million years old. Now there are many species of Australopithecines. This is a genus, but what I wanna start with is the, or are the general traits. And you can see them in this comparison here. We have a gorilla, we have an oscillopith, and then we have a modern human. So you can see these gradual transitions taking place. And I think what makes oscillopithecines special is that they're right smack in the middle. They're still about half ape, but also about half human. They've developed traits and are kind of right smack in the middle of this transition. You can see the facial prognathism has reduced, the cranium has, has enlarged, the brow ridge has reduced, the dental arcade has become less rectangular, less narrow, the form in that magnum is more centrally located overall. Now these creatures were kind of half human, half ape in terms of their bodies, bipedal from the waist down and ape largely from the waist up. They had small brain sizes, about a third of modern Homo sapiens at about 400 to 500 cubic centimeters, but still larger than apes at the time. They also had thick enamel on their very large molars, and they still had relatively large faces with large jaw muscles. And the reason for this is that they're still eating a, a, a raw diet and they're eating nuts and things that really require some grinding. So we still have it smaller than among the ape, but the face still is larger and more dense and more intense and robust than we would see in later humans. Now, one example of this and, and arguably a potential ancestor for us is the species Australopithecus afarensis. And the famous sample is Lucy. So you can see Lucy's body skeleton here on the left, what we have of her skeleton and then a recreation of her on the right. 
And in the skeleton, ideally you can identify the bipedal traits right away. The angle of the femur is significant. And the pelvic blades, the iliac blades are short and bowl shaped, but they're still very short. These species were about three to four feet tall with significant sexual dimorphism, the females being about a foot shorter on average than the males. Now, Lucy had all the traits that we saw in the previous slide, but she also has the upper body that you can visualize of an ape. Her arms are much shorter than an ape and her fingers are a little shorter as well, but they're still too long to be a later biped and so are the fingers. The shoulders, the chest, the arms and the fingers are all still being used for brachiation. So Lucy was probably a species, a member of a species that still utilized the trees probably at night for protection. What's interesting about the Oshilopiths also is that by comparing brain sizes of the infants that we found, the adults, what we have learned about these species is also that their cognitive abilities appear to be changing and their maturation rate appears to be lengthening. They're taking longer to grow up. And this is important because modern homo sapiens have the longest period of, of maturation, of growth to adulthood of any species on earth. And we're also looking for a gradually lengthening maturation period. Now, finally, you are meeting the Paranthropus. And Paranthropus, a decade ago, were still categorized with Australopithecines because they share all of these features here, essentially. However, their skulls are so derived in a number of features, so specialized, that they were eventually put into their own genus. And you can see two samples of these here, Ifeopithecus and then Bosai. Right off the bat, you should notice the sagittal crest at the top and the gigantic size of these cheekbones, these zygomatic arches and of their jaw. This was an intense face with a lot of musculature. The reason for this among Paranthropus genuses is because their diet was even more grinding oriented than Oshilopiths were. So they had to develop this almost gorilla-like crest. You can see that gorillas have this, this is a female, so she doesn't have it as much, but male gorillas have a large crest and their skull for muscle attachment for the neck and the jaw. And Paranthropus had this as well because they had a very specialized, very tough, rough diet that required a significant amount of power in the face. Now these species are not believed to be ancestral to humans because they're so derived. We don't see humans with these features, modern humans with these features. And so we think that Paranthropus uh, genus and species were kind of derived creatures that popped up and eventually died off by about a million years ago or so. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to move on to our genus, the genus Homo. And we're going to look again at transitional species as we gradually accumulate more and more traits towards modern Homo sapiens. If you have any questions about this lecture or any of the material, please reach out email, discussion board, or my office hours. Otherwise, I will see you for our last lecture.